Another macro sociological perspective that I think is really important for us to think about as we discover or discuss the impact of digital technology on globalization and educational equity is the conflict perspective, which can be called either Marxist or neo-Marxist or, or anything else. It could be more critical theory. It could be lots of different things that are part of a sort of macro sociological perspective. And so uh, let's talk about that a little bit. A conflict theory is a, uh, a way of thinking about a functional perspective, but that says that purely sociological functional perspectives are inadequate to explain the dynamism, oops, the dynamism of social systems. So from this perspective, change and conflict are integral parts of society. You have to have change and conflict in order for society to move forward. In fact, change in the social structure is the desirable state from a conflict perspective. That's going to be important to recognize. Now, the larger way to think about this, then, is to think about society as a process of synthesis. And I, I apologize again, it cuts off the screen. But we have the, the thesis, the antithesis, and then we have the synthesis. And that says new belief system, if you were able to read all the way down. But let's start with the thesis, right? So society reflects an interplay of social forces. And this idea of thesis, which is Hegel's term, if you're into uh, sociology and philosophy, Hegel's term thesis is really a collective definition of reality that travels through time. So it's, it's the way that people think about things that, that moves forward throughout uh, temporal space. And it's maintained by groups of people who maintain it by virtue of the benefit that they gain from it. Right? So it's going to be people who are getting some gain or getting some benefit out of however reality is being defined that are going to be the ones to establish what the thesis is. Now, the idea then is that social structures emerge out of this use of power. In other words, this use of power to maintain or to encourage dominance and uh, superiority among particular groups. And for those who benefit from the current structure, there's a desire to maintain the status quo. That is, keep things as they are, reproduce inequalities, reproduce the system of stratification or differentiation that exists. So from an educational perspective, the groups that would be promoting uh, the, the, the sort of the, the traditional functional view of status quo in schools would be from this conflict perspective, this thesis perspe perspective, they would be the ones that are benefiting from that system. So they would be the ones that are in positions of power and authority, who have the, the, the um, control over resources, who are the dominant groups. Now, as this structure emerges, one of its byproducts is exploitation. Right? People are used by others to maintain their position and power. And as this thesis continues, the exploitation increases. So to maintain the status quo, power is going to be used to maintain the belief that the status quo is correct. This is that manufacture of consent that we've talked about so many times or at least maintain the belief that, uh, that there's nothing that anyone can do about it, that it, that's just the way it is, right? So hence the lack of change causes a stagnation or it causes the reproduction of the status quo. So for example, in a society that maintains male dominance, we might find that the roles and status relationships between men and women in a school favor men simply because they are men or favor boys simply because they are boys. There are, there are obvious advantages to getting a greater share of social resources, right? More power, um, more dominance, more uh, ability to set the agenda because of this, this collective belief, this thesis. So from this perspective, men or boys have a vested interest in maintaining whatever exists, maintaining the way that things are. And why not? They win simply by being male. So. In order for this thesis to work, women and girls have to believe that they are less valuable or less competent or of less worth than men simply because they are women. Right? Now this is a problem, you might agree.
So how does then change occur? How do we get towards synthesis? Well, change occurs when conflict is created either between or among multiple forces. The collectively maintained reality, the thesis, remember Hegel's term, and one or more antithesis or opposing belief, that's also Hegel's term, have to be in coexistence. So take the word apart. You've got anti, which is against, and thesis, which is the collective belief. So antithesis is against the thesis. So groups form with alternative values and beliefs that challenge the thesis. Right? So it might be a, uh, a women's movement or a feminist movement or some other group that would fight for the rights and the worth and the value and the status of women in society. That would be the antithesis group. Okay, so when the thesis, the collective belief, and the antithesis, the opposing belief, uh, collide or come together or interact, that produces conflict. And to say it the least, this can become very messy, right? This part is messy. Groups and individuals within each of these camps will have their identities tied to these beliefs. And so when there is conflict over them, there's going to be some serious struggles about not just who's in power and who's has resources and who is dependent and not, or not, but how do people identify? How do people know who they are? How do groups actually maintain a collective identity? Now, the outcome of the conflict between the thesis and the antithesis is a synthesis. Basically, a synthesis is something new. In this case, a new belief system or a new idea or a new way of life. So, for example, if we have the male dominance thesis, which says that men or boys are superior, and that travels through time, and we'll say that that does so by establishing itself and, and reproducing itself in the school systems or the educational systems, that goes on and on and on through time until it is challenged by the antithesis that, that says that women are of equal or greater ability or value. And that conflict creates a synthesis, right? The synthesis is access to new opportunities for women or increased dominance and power to maintain it by men. Right? And the outcome then would be a new belief system, like it or not, no matter what that new belief system is. So the crux of a conflict perspective says that this thesis is somehow run by the dominant groups. And it's based on power and resources and opportunities that come from that, right? The antithesis, or the opposing belief, is by anybody who challenges that. Anybody who challenges the dominant group's power, resources, and opportunities. And if we think about schools, then this conflict between the thesis and antithesis is going to come in the schools when there's a group that arises that says schools should not be reproducing whatever this collective belief is. We used the example of, of a gender just a minute ago. But it could be anything, really. And then the synthesis is what comes out of that. How these two sort of come together in a way that then creates a new idea, which might have elements of both. Right? So there still might be some dominant uh, power uh, uh, relationships or um, power positions in there. However, there are also going to be recognitions of these, these new or different or challenging ideas that will somehow either balance or differently approach the dominant group's ideas. And this becomes part of the new belief system. And then this whole cycle just reproduces over and over again because the new belief system becomes the thesis, right? Until someone comes along and says, hey, I have another idea and we need to challenge that. So, from a conflict perspective, we have to ask, what are the sources and the consequences of conflict in social systems? Right? And it, the social system we're concerned with is largely the education system. Right? So what are the sources and consequences of conflict in schools and education systems? Next, how do conflicting groups organize and mobilize related to, again, we're thinking of education worldwide. I'm just going to put WW for worldwide. Next, what are the sources of inequality in society? Remember the causes, conditions, and consequences. 
Right? So the sources could be similar to the causes. What are the causes of inequality in society? They are many. It would be difficult to identify all of them, but they have typically been identified as race and ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic status, and gender. Not to say that gender is causing inequality, but it is a, uh, a, a source of it. Right? Whenever there is a clearly identified difference, there's going to be some sort of in unequal relationship that can arise. And then finally, how do societies change themselves? Remember, from a functionalist perspective, it's imbalance, which was viewed as a perhaps a problem. From a conflict perspective, it's going to be this struggle between thesis and antithesis, and it's going to be considered a positive thing, a way to move forward. So again, what causes conflict? Competition over scarce resources and opportunities. And society as a whole, and schools in particular, are driven by conflict between dominant and subordinate groups or classes, often in relation to race, socioeconomic status, or gender. Now remember our idea of the manufacture of consent and, and our friend Karl Marx. This idea is to solidify, extend, and legitimate their control. Dominant groups structure social institutions like schools, I added that part, to operate in ways that will maintain or increase their own advantage, but promulgate an ideology that presents the system as fair. So you have a group that is disadvantaged that is consenting to themselves being disadvantaged and being oppressed because their consent has been manufactured, it has been legitimized, it has been incorporated into legitimate institutions like schools, and it puts forward this ideology that the system is fair. Remember, remember Talcott Parsons saying that schools were a meritocracy? Right? That's a great example of manufacturing consent. If everyone, even those who are disadvantaged, believe that schools are a meritocracy, then if someone isn't doing well in school or if someone is treated differently in school or as a result of their education, that's just because from a meritocracy point of view, they didn't earn it or work hard enough or deserve it. But from the conflict point of view, we know that it is, it's a trick, right? If we're going to say it very bluntly. Now, Lots of different ways that we can talk about reproduction and schooling purposes. Uh, some of it is economic reproduction, right? One of the big ideas with economic reproduction is this idea of correspondence from Bowles and Gintis, Schooling and Capitalist America, published in 1976. This quote from page uh, 131 of their book, I think is a great one. Uh, and let me just read it so we can talk about it briefly. They say the educational system helps integrate youth into the economic system through a structural correspondence between its social relations and those of production. The structure of social relations in education not only inures the student to the discipline of the workplace, but develops the types of personal demeanor, modes of self-presentation, self-image, and social class identification, which are the crucial ingredients of job adequacy. In other words, they say that reproduction of inequality exists through schools because all the educational systems do is integrate youth into the economy. And the economy, remember our, our functionalist point of view, the economy is also like a body. It's like a living system. There have to be people that are the brain and the heart, and there have to be people that are the rear end and the foot, right? And so if you're looking for correspondence, it's a role allocation function. I'm not going to talk about these so much because I think you cover them in other classes. We can also talk about cultural reproduction and the, uh, the idea of cultural capital and how that plays into what people know and do in schools. We can talk about the role of the state in creating hegemony. Um, we've talked about de-schooling society from Ivan Illich, which I won't go over again here, but if you want, you can pause this and take a look at some of the ideas that I put, put out there. We've already talked about Bowles and Gintis. Uh, there they are. We haven't talked so much about Carnoy and Levin uh, and schooling and work in the democratic state, but it's another piece that you could look at if you want to know more about the conflict perspective and this correspondence between education and the economy. If you want to think specifically about the thesis antithesis idea in a U.S. context, look at Jonathan Kozel's Savage Inequalities. If you want to look at a more theoretical and critical perspective, look at Henry Giroux's work, any of his work. Right? And then if you want to think about this more broadly, conflict perspectives almost always come back to economy.